so it's Halloween, and so I thought I would uh, use my talk to talk about releasing fear, releasing fear. I was raised by pro professional fearers. Is that a word? Warriors, yes. I was raised by people who were older, elderly. I was, I was a surprise. Um, I guess that was a nice way of putting it. And uh, my parents were terrified of, of life, really. They were terrified that there was going to become another depression because they had lived through the depression. If not the depression, hippies were going to take over. They were horrified by hippies. They were terrified that my oldest sister, was she was in college at the time, was going to run off and be a hippie. It just horrified them. And the poor girl, she went to uh, Georgia Southwestern, which was uh, in America's Georgia, not, not a hotbed of hippie activity by any stretch of the imagination. She was president of her sorority. She was vice president of the Richard, elect Richard Nixon uh, committee in America's. And her favorite musical group were the Carpenters. Yeah. You never heard anybody say, let's drop some acid and put Karen Carpenter on. It wasn't a part of the, the zeitgeist at that time. <laughs> We've only just begun. I see the colors. <laughs> now, if that, none of that happened, if none of that happened, the thing that also scared them was if that, none of that happened, they were sure this was going to happen, Jesus was coming back. Jesus was coming back. And that, that scared them the most. And they went to a church every Sunday that just preached about how horrible it was going to be when he came back. And I remember thinking, well, he was only nice the first time he came. You know, why are we so worried? And it is, it is sad to think that what should have been a comfort to them really, really terrified them, kept, kept them up, and, and kept them from living life to the fullest. They didn't live life to the fullest. They were in fear, fear. Someone said about fear, false evidence appearing real. That's what fear is, false evidence appearing real. Now, my teacher, Tennedy Schultz, he loved Halloween. He didn't like ha uh, Christmas so much, but he liked Halloween. He said it taught kids how to confront their fears, to make fun of their fears. And he thought this was a very healthy thing to do, to make fun of your fears. I think it's also very healthy, and I think the tradition of sending kids out in the neighborhood to trick or treat, I think that is also a very healthy thing to do. It's gone away a little bit. It seems to be kind of picking back up. I hope so. Because it allows the kids to know that they have power, that they can go up to a door, ring the doorbell, that they can make a request, that the, typically the homeowners, you know, ooh and awe about their costumes. The kids have had some kind of decision in, you know, the costumes. It empowers them. It lets them know that they've got a whole community around them that is supportive and, and encouraging and that they can, they can get, you know, support from. So I think it's a, an important thing to do. Now, the whole tradition of, of that, of kids going up to houses around this time of the year, it actually goes back to the Middle Ages. Uh, it was celebrated on All Saints Day, and so it started in the Middle Ages. Poor kids would go up to houses, and the bargain was if you give us a sweet roll with the sign of cross, the cross in it, that we will do prayers for any family members who've died in the past year. That's, that's the whole thing of trick-or-treat. Now, it showed up in America in the 30s. It first showed up around the uh, celebration of Thanksgiving. And the idea was that you would dress up as a ragamuffin. I'm not really sure what a ragamuffin is, but that was the costume. And you would go up and you would ask for, for treats. Around the 30s, it began to morph into Halloween. And when the baby boomers came, started having their, when the pe people, when the baby boomers came through, that's when it really took off. Yes. <laughs> now, here's the interesting thing. 
in the, in the span of my childhood, from when I was a little kid to I became a teenager, it changed again. And because it beca people began to be concerned that it wasn't safe to send your kids out, and particularly because the candy they got could be have pins or needles in it or razor blades in the apples. Those were the, those were the worst things. You could have a razor blade in the apple. Like any kid with a bag of candy is going to reach in and eat an apple. That has never happened, never will happen. Yeah. Now, here's the interesting thing, because researchers have gone back and researched hospital records, and what they have found out, that that was largely an urban myth. That really did not happen. There were a couple of cases, but it was really never a widespread thing. So how did a false rumor create such a profound change? Because it really did. It was, you know, my, my younger sisters, they ran all over the neighborhood. And my parents let them do it on their own. They just ran out. By the time I became like 10 or 11, it was a much more controlled situation. In fact, I remember in Macon, you could take your bag of candy to the hospital and they would x-ray it for you. Yeah. Why did that happen? Here's your answer. Because parents were inclined to believe it. They were open to that fear. Uh, they were open to believe that the world was a dangerous place. And of course, in the 60s, there was lots of turmoil going on. So it was an easy lie to believe. Now, the strange thing, I think a curious thing, is it seems that we humans have a tendency to enjoy fear. We kind of enjoy it a little bit. You know, one of the most oft-repeated um, suggestions in the Bible, which really this is the thing that's most, the Spirit tells us most, is fear not. Fear not. Every time an angel shows up to a human, that's the first thing they say. Don't be afraid. And if you think about it, it's kind of a curious thing because why when we're, we're presented with the closest thing to God's love and, and mercy and compassion and kindness, why would it scare us? Why would it? Now, fear has caused most of our problems. You know, in Scripture it says that Adam and Eve, they ate from the tree of, of knowledge and, and the Christian version. It's a little bit different than the Jewish version, but the Christian version is they opened their eyes to sexuality. Oh, goodness, you know. <laughs> yeah, and that, that caused, eh, sex is a problem, but let me tell you, fear has caused way more problems. It has hindered us. It has held us back. It has been the impetus of much of the world. All the wars we've gone through, the human calam calamities, fear, fear. Eleanor Roosevelt fascinating character in history. If you want a good read on uh, history, get something on Eleanor Roosevelt. She said, do the thing that scares you and the death of fear is certain. Do the thing you're afraid of and it vanishes the power it has over you. Don't do it. It increases in energy and it will get to a point where it will drain your energy to the place you can't confront it. Deal with it, and it loses its grips and dissolves like the mist under the morning sun. But if you don't confront it, it grows and drains your energy, and it leaves you paralyzed, un unable to move on it. You know, I have a wonderful, lovely uh, friend. She's extremely successful, world-traveled, uh, she lives in Atlanta. She's retired with a, a huge income. She can really do whatever she wants to do. What she likes to do is spend day after day on her computer investigating conspiracies, one after another. Uh, I happened to make the recommendation, which she did not like, uh, <laughs> that she allow some positive energy into her life. Uh, you know, just, just 
just get something else positive coming. You don't have to stop doing that. Just bring something positive into your life. And I said, why don't you go downtown to downtown? If you've never been, Atlanta has an amazing theater. It's called the Fox Theater. And it's an amazing place. If you're ever in Atlanta, go tour it, uh, even without a production. But they have all these Broadway plays that they bring through. I said, go see a Broadway play. Go see it. Oh, are you crazy? There's crime in downtown Atlanta. There are stock stacking dead bodies on the sidewalks down there. You can't, you can't go down there. You'll be murdered as soon as they look at you. Well, Atlanta has a crime problem, but not in the places they're putting on Broadway shows. You know, they don't have it there, but she's not willing to, she's not willing to allow it. She's fear-bound. And she's bringing more fear into her life. You want fear? Turn on the news. Turn on the Internet. And who's paying for it? Who's paying for it? Who advertises on the news? It's your uh, insurance companies, your health uh, companies, pharmaceuticals. They want you worried about what kind of shape you're in. Uh, they got a pill to solve it or a, a policy to, to protect you. And you'll never have enough. You'll always be wanting more. So turn it off and allow something positive to come in. You don't have to be ignorant, but just make sure a deliberate positive energy is coming in your life. Mahatma Gandhi said, the enemy is fear. He says, we think it's hate, but it's fear. He says, fear masquerades as anger, prejudice, and even violence. He says, but at its core, it's fear that drives these emotions. Fear of the unknown, fear of loss, fear of change. Last week, I made a big mistake, big mistake. I was in the car. I had forgot my cell phone. I normally listen to audio books, so I turned AM, it, Turned the radio on, happened to be on the AM stations, and there was a talk news program going on. And it's the guy, he's a national guy, and he, uh, so he's, he's a big successful guy. And he was ranting and raving, ranting and raving, because he had gone to a Lowe's improvement store, big Lowe's department store, and there they had the termidity, termidity of trying to sell, I, I don't want to offend anybody here, trying to sell a black Santa Claus, an African-American Santa Claus. Oh, my goodness. Never mind the war in Ukraine. Never mind the turmoil in Israel. Never mind what's going on in our political life. An African-American Santa Claus, the horror, the horror. And he kept saying is, everybody knows Santa's white. And I thought to myself, buddy, you're talking about a, 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 a literary person that lives in the North Pole who has probably labor issues with a group of elves and flies around the world with magical reindeers. I don't think ethnicity is the problem with this story. So we need to recognize that Fear is, the, is what we have to deal with, and, and it happens for us as well as anyone. And we can transform it, not with aggression, but with compassion and understanding. A lovely person that I listen to each week, she said if we would just spend 60 seconds a day, 60 seconds a day thinking about the world in love and compassion, she said we would change it, just 60 seconds. And we can make that change because we are that powerful, particularly when we link our thoughts and prayers with our good works. This is what we want to do. It takes more just thoughts and prayers. You got to put some, you got to move your feet. You got to get out in the world and make a change. This past week, we took our, all our old computers over to the Betty Griffith Center because they're going to wipe them off and, and they're going to uh, give them to the families that leave the Betty Griffin Center. And they talked about how, how grateful they were that we're doing this. 
And we may probably won't solve all of those families, but we may solve one. We may help one. And that's all we're called to do. It's God's universe. You do your part, and you then you turn the rest over to spirit. But your part is extremely powerful. Your part can change the world. And because here's what it is. It's thoughts and deeds uh, that, that we, can, we can make a difference because the fear that's out there, the turmoil that's out there, it really does not have that much power because goodness and love and compassion has all the power of God behind it. War, turmoil, confusion, that's just empowered by human silliness and, and misconceptions. We, that's, the, that's the only power it has. When we move out in love and compassion, compassion, we've got the universe behind us, and we can make a huge difference. Dr. Holmes, the founder of our teaching, he said, if we would just not give so much attention to the turmoil and the anger in the world, it would disappear. If we would just not give it extra energy. Kennedy said, my teacher, he said, we don't really have anything to fear. He says, there is no devil, and God is only love. There is no devil, and God is only love. We're all spiritual beings. We're all on this human journey, destined to return to the embrace of love. Fear is but a cosmic dance that we engage in at this dense level of creation. It's but a transient visitor, a shadow that fades um, uh, uh, with the brilliance of our true essence. It's woven into the fabric of our existence. It's been our companion since the dawn of humanity. Uh, it's finely tuned so that we could evolve. But uh, now that we have evolved in this modern life, fear often takes a different form. It disguises itself as self-doubt, societal expectations, and the unknown mysteries of tomorrow. Our experiences with fear have created pathways in our brain that reinforce our fearful, fearful conclusions about life. We don't get the life we dream for. We don't even get the life we pray for. We get the life we think we deserve. And if we can raise above our expectation and help others achieve a greater life for themselves, we will lift ourselves up above our own expectations, and we will witness the mercy and love of God raining down on us. Dr. Jill Taylor, she uh, wrote a wonderful book a couple of years ago, My Stroke of Insight. She had a stroke, and for a while it damaged the analytical part of her brain. And when that happened, suddenly she realized that she no longer was burdened by the fear that had troubled her all of her life. It, her experience gave her a path forward, suggesting that fear is intricately linked to our conclusions we've made about life, and with conscious effort, we can reshape these assumptions, transcending fear's grip. She said, we are being, when we are being compassionate, we consider another circumstance with love rather than judgment, she said, to be compassionate is to move into the now, right now, with an open heart and consciousness, a willing to be supportive. And we need this now more than ever. We're in a time with global changes that leave us all terrified. So let us recognize that fear and acknowledge it and know that we can be a catalyst for transformation. Spirit is calling on you. It's not surprising that you've been born in this time. Each one of us is needed and necessary for this transformation. There's a new heaven and a new earth coming, and we're going to bring it about. Seneca, the uh, uh, Stoic, he says, we suffer more from imagination than in reality. Fear often thrives in imagination. We conjure up things that are more terrifying than we can imagine. We can turn the, the vice president of the reelect Richard Nixon Club into a hippie selling poppies on the street corners of San Francisco. 
Harry Truman said, for every three problems you see coming at you, two are going to run into the ditch before you get to you. So why worry? It's by grounding ourselves, by embracing mindfulness, that we can silence the voices of fear, finding serenity in the midst of turmoil. Mindfulness. It's a powerful tool to confront our fears, becoming conscious. That's the reason we're here, to become more and more conscious. This is the entire aim of evolution, that spirit is descending into the physical realm through us to become more and more conscious. Mindfulness invites us to observe our thoughts and emotions without judgment, to witness the ebb and flow of fear without being consumed by it. And through practice like meditation and prayer, we can cultivate an awareness that pierces through the illusion of fear, revealing the inherent peace that resides inside of us so that we can envision a world liberated from the shackles of fear, a world where compassion and understanding reign supreme, where the divisions of our beliefs and backgrounds are celebrated, not feared. So we want to recognize the antidote to fear is not merely courage, it is love. Love is the most potent force in the universe. It dissolves fear like the sunshine dissolves the thickest cloud. Dr. King says, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. So let us be bearers of love. Let's be ambassadors of light, dispelling fear wherever we go. Let our actions, our words, and our thoughts resonate with the profound truth that love is the most powerful force in the universe and that it can dispel fear in all its guises so that we can confront our fears with open hearts and courageous souls because in doing so, we're going to liberate ourselves. We're going to liberate each other. We're going to liberate the world. And we're going to march on to that beautiful and glorious day. We're all going to be able to join hands in hands. Sisterhood and brotherhood will reign over all. And we will liberate ourselves from all this confusion, this turmoil, this foolishness. And we will know we're all beloved children of God here to experience the blessings of spirit raining down on us. It's what we've come to do. We can do it. And now's the time. It's the truth in your life this morning. It's the truth in mine. And so it is.